Welcome back to another segment here on GEMS Podcast. With me today in the hot seat is Mark Cortez, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about his background because he is definitely multifaceted and multidimensional, similar to myself. And who may I be? You may be asking if you're just tuning in for the first time. I'm Miss Genesis Samaris Kemp, the founder and host of this platform. So let me tell you about my guest. Mark Cortez is a climate reality advocate and the author of the forthcoming title, Climaturity, A Journey into the Muddy Climate Middle. Climaturity offers a new perspective on the climate controversy through the pro- pragmatic lens of a longtime renewable energy industry veteran. Part scientist, part satire, and part snark. He takes a stand against the climate panic movement. He advocates for a transparent climate discussion where half-truths are completed, climate science limitations are put into content and context, and politicians are held accountable for spending taxpayer dollars. Ooh, hot button right there, y'all. Mark Cortez offers a new climate narrative down the middle aisle away from today's climate extremers. So he's down the middle, y'all, and he's going to be be able to look at things from both vantage point, but like he said, bring it into a pragmatic approach. So let's bring on the man behind it all, Mark Cortez. Thank you, Genesis. Uh, it uh, sounds so, like you said, so hot button when you uh, when you actually hear it read aloud. So, uh, um, and I'm knowing that the, we're not going to discuss politics, but right down the middle, right? This is just a transparent and open discussion about this uh, difficult subject. Absolutely. And before we dive down this road, or should I say, cruise down the road and then we could <laughs> dive below sea level. I definitely want to give the audience a chance to connect with you in a fun and personal manner to lighten up things and start connecting the dots with a little bit more of who you are outside of the work that you're doing. So there are two options, Mark. We could do an icebreaker or we could do a rapid fire 10 question game and it's rapid for a reason. What are you in the mood for? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, dealer's choice, whatever you, I, I can, I can roll with either one of them. So I'll get, I'll leave it to the host. Okay. Let's do rapid fire. We're playing rapid fire with Mark and Genesis. Do, 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 do. Question number one, what's one thing about yourself that makes you uniquely you that someone may not know about you? Oh, good question. I think, um, what I would probably offer, and maybe this is even where my book is coming from, which is I tend to uh, uh, look at things from uh, both sides of a, uh, of, a, of a situation, both questions, and uh, I spend a lot of time uh, sorting through lots of information and then making up my own mind about certain things, so some big things like climate and all kinds of things. So that's probably a distinct, uh, I don't know if it, is it a feature, <laughs> something that I could uh, take some credit for. So question two, what's your dream car? Dream car. Great question. Um, I've always loved convertibles. So I live uh, in central, central coast of California. So, you know, a, um, a, a nice, uh, maybe a Jeep that I could take down to the beach with uh, that I can pull the, the, uh, the canvas top down and take my dog and my kids out there. That would probably be pretty good. You'll fit right into Texas because they normally have this topless Jeep event where everyone with the Wranglers, who do the Jeep waves, they all get together and hang out on the beach. But let me mind y'all, Galveston is not a beach, in my opinion. I call it the mud pond. And the reason why I call it the mud pond is because the water is very dark and murky. And I know some of you may be upset that I'm saying it, but I am biased because my mother is West Indian, so she's Caribbean, and I've seen a clean beach with clear water. And that's what I call a beach. (laughs) Yep, I hear you. I've been to Galveston, so yeah. And I think... um, yeah, I'm not sure if my dream car and your dream car could race because I love Need for Speed. So mine right now is a Lamborghini, a black on the outside with black on the inside with some blue neon lights, my favorite nice. color. <laughs> nice. Question three, what's your favorite food? Favorite food? Uh, I love salmon, love salmon. So I know it's not very exciting, but uh, you know, good piece of salmon grilled, 
uh, with some vegetables and some potatoes, good stuff. Okay, question four. Who's the cook in your home, you or your wife? Oh, definitely not me. I, uh, I can burn anything, even, the, even if you don't have to cook it. So my wife is, uh, she's actually quite good and my daughter has gotten pretty good at it as well, so. Question five, if you could sit down and have a meal with any person, past or present, who would it be? Walt Disney. <laughs> I always loved Walt Disney, not just because of his movies, but boy, if there's ever someone who, who crafted a new way of doing so many different things and left such an impact. Uh, I know there are certainly bigger people with bigger impacts, but I always was very intrigued by Walt Disney, his story, uh, whatever you think about the Walt Disney Company these days, I don't know too many people who haven't been touched by Walt Disney and what he did and his vision and how he uh, changed the world with it. Question six, <clears throat> since you are involved in climate and you think about the move for more cars that are EVs versus gas, what's your choice? Are you going the EV route or do you still like, man, all the cars I really like that are souped up, take gas right now. You know, uh, if you ever have a chance to ride in an EV, and maybe you have, I mean, you know, it's, it's a great piece of tech. It's a fun thing to drive, but it's not saving the planet. So um, so I'm about due for another car. I'm not buying an EV. I won't buy an EV. I will buy a hybrid. Um, and um, just, just for the reasons that I <laughs> outline in my book, but my own personal thing is uh, I, I can guarantee that EVs will not save the planet. And um, I think a better alternative is just drive less. And so hybrids, we already have them. We don't need to spend uh, trillions to get them. They're here. They work great. Um, they, and if, if uh, I want to cut my own uh, CO2 emissions, I just will drive less and ride my bike. Love that. And we're going to definitely dive into that whenever we get into the next segment. Question seven. If you could recreate any significant moment in your life, Mark, whether you're recreating it or you're reliving it, which one are you doing and what significant moment is it? Boy, that's a good, those are great questions. Uh, let me, I'm thinking uh, here. Um, you know, I think the first time, my, the first product that I ever built on my own was a bobblehead doll, believe it or not. So back in the day, uh, not to get into politics, but I was, uh, we had a president, Bill Clinton, back in the day. And at the time, I thought, uh, actually, before him was a guy named Dan Quayle. Maybe you remember him or you've seen him. And I was like, if ever there was a bobblehead, it was Dan Quayle. And so I started with him and then they lost. And so I completed it with Bill Clinton. Um, and so I made a Bill Clinton bobblehead doll back in the day. You know, the internet was just starting and years and years and years ago. Um, so I actually did it. And the first time I saw that product uh, sitting in a retail store, it was a Spencer Gifts uh, up at my house, just sitting there, this little plastic bobblehead doll that I had made. I just, I was running around screaming. I thought it was just the coolest thing I ever did. So uh, if anyone has ever created something, you're a writer, you, when you see something that you have written out there into the world, uh, you're about to be a mom when you see your own baby interact with the world, right? It's, it's a whole different feeling. It's uh, so that was a very satisfying thing. So I have uh, throughout my career, tried to do as much of that as I could to replicate that feeling, but also just accomplish things. That's super cool. And you said Spencer Gifts. That's like the joke store, right? That they That's had the joke store. It's like Hot Topic or something like yeah. that. Right? So I was up there buying something completely different, uh, buying a joke for someone. And there was my doll and, and people had whacked his head so much that his head was all like bent over and he was all bruised and stuff. And I was just cracking up and and uh, so, but I was like, I made that thing. And the, the guys are like, yeah, sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> sure you did. I invented an aluminum foil, <laughs> right? So, but, you know, I just, I just was like, okay, well, so, you know, it, it pays, you know, I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. And it's certainly a lot easier now than it was when I did it, but uh, it shows a little faith in your ideas, even if it's a crazy, stupid, silly idea, right? It was like, everyone looked at me like, what, you're going to spend some money to go build a bobblehead doll? Really? And, uh, and I did it, so. Amazing. And question eight, what's your drink of choice? Coffee, tea, or something else? I like coffee. I, uh, you know, I'll have a glass of wine. I, um, I guess I, would, I love a good dark roast and, and sit there and read the Sunday paper. It's a good way to kick off a, a good Sunday. <laughs> and let's see, question nine. You get three random acts of kindness per day that you're supposed to do for someone else. 
What are your three for today? Good question. Um, I well, I where I live in San Luis Obispo, and like a lot of places in California, and probably a lot of places these days, a lot of homeless issues, and so. Uh, I don't always give people money, but I, I try to acknowledge them and say hello and good morning to them because they have their own morning routines as well. So that's uh, it's at least an act of humanity that I try to do. Um, uh, some of it is with my with my kids every day that I just try to make sure that uh, less so now that it's in the summer, but in the, you know when they're out there in school and they're dealing with all the junior high and elementary school drama, I just always make sure that they understand that. Uh, Whatever happens today, they can come home tonight and they'll be with their family and, uh, and there's a new day tomorrow and that uh, we love them. And uh, so that's it. Um, and then I try to make sure that I talk with my uh, my one remaining parent uh, every day just to make sure that uh, we're still connected. So amazing. And question 10. It's our pass or play question. And here are the rules. If you pass, you throw the football or you kick the ball or you dunk the ball to me and you get to ask me a question. Or if you choose to play, I ask one last question to wrap up rapid fire. So do you want to pass or play? I will pass to you. Okie dokie. What's your question? So what drove you to uh, become a writer in the first place? A day of frustration in corporate America, <laughs> oil and gas. <laughs> oh, you remember that? Very good. So it was uh, just uh, one of those days where you just said, what the heck am I doing? Or who are these people? And, and you had to write it down. Yep. And writing um, always came therapeutic to me. I was writing in high school, stopped writing. And then um, I just picked it up one day in corporate. I had no idea that I was gonna write a full blown book. I just wrote down the words, chocolate drop in corporate America. And I said, I'm melanated. I hate when people keep saying, oh, you're black or you're African-American or what are you? Cause I am multicultural um, and first generation American. And I'm like, you know what? Chocolate is irresistible. And I've never met one person that just has one bite of chocolate and says, I'm satisfied and I worked in corporate America. So what better way to put chocolate drop and corporate America together? <laughs> Good for you. I might, you know, my writing uh, history is similar. It was always therapeutic for me. And uh, I'm a brown man in corporate America. And I grew up, you know, brown man from Oakland. And, and you know, my destiny was uh, going to be work in the fields or the factories or uh, the warehouses unless I chose otherwise. Right. And that, and that was sort of how it's always in Northern California. That's sort of a norm. And uh, so I, uh, I've had um, similar experiences in that regard as well. So, uh, so I, I, can, I can relate. So writing is good for that. Yeah, amazing. And now let's jump into the segment of climate maturity. So yep. I want you to hold up the book and give us a background into the book. So hold it up a little closer and let's unpack the cover. Because I think a cover can really make or break a book because I think we've all been there, guilty as charged, where we have went to either the bookstore or we saw something online. You're like, hmm, I don't know about that book. And you passed yeah. it by. But if you would have just really paused and not be so vain and go beyond the cover and say, what is the content in the book? And maybe read the first page or the synopsis, then you would have bought the book. But yeah. you just looked at the cover and kept on going. So walk us through that, Mark, your cover yeah, well, and the book. The first thing was uh, the name, right? The title, uh, Climate Charity, A Journey into the Muddy Climate Middle. And so uh, I, what I, I will make up some words in this book because uh, it's born out of frustration, I think, uh, similar to your discussion of your own writing style, uh, was, um, boy, I, you know, I, I started this climate journey my, you know, back in 1999 when I sold my first solar panel and was in the solar business for decades energy storage, electric vehicle infrastructure. So I've been on the front lines of this discussion. And, you know, amazingly enough, um, this has gotten so polarized, like polarized, like we, we, we know nowadays. And my, uh, what I started to hear as the prevailing narrative about what's going on with the climate was just so far away removed from my own experience. So that feeling has started to, uh, um, to really motivate me to start thinking more about it and doing some research. And so climate maturity is my way to capture a, I guess an ethos of, hey, maybe we should just start having a dialogue and figure out what we know, what we don't know and figure out how we're actually gonna try to solve this problem collectively. So I called it the muddy climate middle. Uh, I came up with the logo, just something to swirl and maybe catch your eye a little bit. Um, but the muddy climate middle, because as soon as you venture away from each, uh, from either of the extremes, 
it gets muddy pretty quickly. And so it seemed appropriate. Uh, you don't do this. You don't venture a new opinion about a very hot button topic like the climate without uh, uh, being willing to catch some arrows in your journey. So it's a, it's a muddy journey. So it seemed appropriate to me. Yeah. And um, just a graphic on your book, like if I, when I was looking at it, it's a circle. So I see the circle and inside the circle, it kind of looks like a wave. And then I was like, oh, he's from Cali. So it could be like a little wave. And then part of the circle kind of looks, I don't know if it's the light reflecting off of the book or if it has like a um, piece of like white, white in it, or if the circle is entirely blue. No, that's, uh, you're right. That's uh, like right up uh, oop, over here. Yeah. Kind of like reflective. And then the blue, the light blue actually has some, uh, looks like some water in there. And so I, I'm also a CEO of a, a water conservation startup. So it sort of fit in together with that as well. So it seemed to, uh, you know, it seemed, I didn't design it myself, but uh, uh, someone did it for me and I liked it and I thought it resonated pretty well. And I thought it was kind of catchy. So I thought I would, I thought I would use it. Yeah, super cool, because I always like to pay attention to details, because you may see th uh, things one way, but it could actually show up as an in another way based on perspectives and how you're looking at things from a different vantage point. So let's dive into climate climaturity here. So right now with the climate, there's so many people, you know, the critics, the haters, the naysayers, the ones who are just flying by the seat of their pants and et cetera. And they're like, oh, we're blaming global warming on this. And my background has been oil and gas for um, 12 years. And some people say, oh, you guys are killing the planet. You're ruining it. And then you have now people who are like, solar is everything. Like, let's put solar panels on our homes. Yeah. Let's do all of this. And then we have EVs and et cetera. So you mentioned you were already doing solars in the 90s. I think you said 1999, right? Yeah, when you sold yeah. your first one. And yeah. then now you see from 1999 to here we are in 2022. What what have you seen in parallel to what what you know from back then to what you see now? Yeah, well, uh, you know, a lot of it is, I mean, first of all, you know, solar technology was invented in the 50s for the space program. So this is not high tech stuff. This is very basic physics, electrons going through silicon. Now there's some new chemistries, but, you know, this is about as basic as it gets. They're wonderful. Solar, solar panels are wonderful. They're incredibly efficient. Um, they do what they do really well. Um, and one of the things uh, that I would took a lot of pride in, I was one of the, the solar industry's first true brand architects. So I spent years crafting the narrative. What's the story? What's the truth? How are we going to tell people? How are we going to convince people to use this esoteric technology? And the way that we did it was we didn't overpromise. We didn't underpromise. We didn't just say we, it was going to save the world. Here's what it does well. Here's why it's good. It actually is getting cheaper and cheaper. And if you do it in these certain ways, it works and it works really well. And so that's still true. I, I've got nothing against it. But about 10 years ago, I think it morphed. You know, it morphed not only solar, but all of a sudden we're all going to be dead by Thursday unless we put solar and windmills and we kill all nukes and everyone's got to stop using fossil fuels. And, and I started to scratch my head going, wait, what? You can't even make one solar panel without oil and gas. I mean, it's a, it's a manufactured product. So, so then I started to seeing all the language that got created around that, like this, this whole idea of zero carbon. And I'm like, um, there's no such thing as a zero carbon energy source. It's, it's fiction. Um, and so what's happened is everyone, everyone is now kind of just telling their own little half truth. Um, or quarter truth and then declaring it, you know, the king of the world. And, um, uh, and where it really drove it home for me is I've got two kids and I also teach college here in San Luis Obispo. And I'm, I'm, you know, teaching young adults that are getting ready to go into the world. And, you know, they're just like, you know, we're dying. We're all going to die. Why have kids? Because the planet's going to be dead. And I remember going, man, how did we fail our kids so badly? That, that's just a miserable, awful uh, message that we've sent out. We've allowed this to happen. And so I, I feel very personal towards this message uh, because it's changed so dramatically. Um, but I also felt like, you know, it's time, if we really want to make progress on this important problem, we actually be have to be talking about it. We have to be having this exact conversation. We don't have to agree uh, on all the things, but we have to be willing to talk about it and, um, and be willing to say, hey, if, you know, if we really are going to tackle this thing the way that everyone is telling us, uh, that it's going to, uh, we have to tackle it, um, at least with some of the solutions, it's hugely expensive. And so these are some very real choices on a personal level. This is not a free lunch. This is going to come 
right out of people's pocketbooks. And so, and then on the oil and gas thing, you know, I, you know, yes. And, you know, part of it, when you're, when you come up through the solar ranks, uh, it's sort of like uh, solar 101. Uh, first of all, hate big oil companies. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, my first uh, solar company was um, uh, solar X and that was bought out by BP. So uh, I worked for shell solar. So um you know, oil companies are companies like anybody else. If they could figure out how to make profit at it, and certainly from an energy perspective, uh, they were some of the earliest innovators in the industry. So, um, I, uh, you know, my feeling is this way with everything. Which is, when I hated social media, when I hated Facebook, I just stopped using it. Right, yeah. personal choice. So I tell everyone who stands up and yells at people who is saying, you know, we got to stop fossil fuels today. I go, dude, stop using them. Do it tomorrow. <laughs> feel free, feel free to stop using all oil and gas products and live the life that, uh, that you're telling us all to live. So I won't, you know, I mean, don't, uh, but until you do that, then come on, uh, you know, so uh, I think it's a bit of a false, uh, I don't even know what the, the right false phrase. narrative, I guess. It's a false narrative. Look, that oil and gas, as much as you don't like it, as much as we don't like it, and we now know that it has some, you know, there's some downsides to unabated oil consumption and okay, fine. Um, but it's also lifted humanity out of, out of caves. Uh, it's also created the greatest economy and country that the world has ever seen. Uh, when you go overseas to um, uh, developing countries, they're not asking you for solar panels, folks. <laughs> they're asking you for cheap, abundant, reliable energy to help lift their entire nation out of poverty. So um, there's, there's a big gap here. And so I don't see much point in hating on oil gas because they're not going away and we need them. And, um, as we are seeing today, when you kick them too much, um, bad things happen, right? We need, we need it. And so I, I'm all in favor of conservation. We need to use less stuff, but that's true of everything. We need to just be yeah. consuming less stuff. So. so I would agree to that point. I think everything in moderation is golden. And whenever you are talking about certain things, I always tell people do your due diligence because a pair of lips can say anything. But when you take time to actually go research the subject matter and you look at the left side versus the right side, then you could begin yeah. to make alignment on what really makes sense based on the knowledge that you have gathered and make sure you're getting your facts from credible sources. And I said, I've been at the bottom of the food chain and I've been at the top of the food chain when I started yeah. in oil and gas like you know my first job was crappy I was an imaging clerk but then I went on to project management then I tapped into HSC so that's health safety and environmental got to learn some of the ramifications around there then um my last my last role with the fortune 500 company because i work for small companies as well as big companies i was doing trade regulations and compliance for a commodity which is polyethylene which is a form of plastics before that i did raw material coordination for pp which is poly polypropylene another form of plastics dealing with a lot of vendors and different stuff like that and whenever you begin to source different uh, components that go into making the final goods, it definitely opens up your eyes to different things because you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know this goes into making this. But yeah. it's because we've always been told one thing, but you've never been on the side where you're actually researching it and you're getting your hands dirty, to say the least. And I'm saying that metaphorically speaking. Um, yeah. And it takes multiple components. It takes you knowing who's out in the unit, what are they running, what grades do we need to make, what goes into making this and et cetera. And there's so many different moving pieces. And uh, let's, I'm gonna be frank, my background um, school-wise, education-wise is supply chain and logistics and technology with double minors in purchasing and organizational leadership and supervision. And I'm like, uh, you want me to work in a chemical plant? Um, <laughs> did you not check my credentials? Uh, but I say that to say sometimes you have to go around full circle in order to appreciate where you come in order to formulate different ideas and um, different ideas to bring to the forefront. And when you are well versed in different subjects, that's where innovation and ideas begin to materialize and you begin to put it out there. And I know when we were talking about the rapid questions, Mark, you mentioned, I asked about the EV or gas, yeah. and you mentioned you would never buy an EV, but you would purchase a hybrid and your next car will be, very well be a hybrid. So can you expound on why you feel the way you feel and what's your reasoning? 
Yeah. I, um, so maybe I was a little bit too harsh about EVs. I love driving them. They're awesome. I, I mean, I drove a Tesla. I was in Vail, Colorado a couple of years ago. A buddy of mine had one, drove it. Fantastic. I, I, was, I kept volunteering to drive. I'm designated driver, you know, because it was fun. It talks to you. There's karaoke. We had a blast. You know, we're driving through the mountains, karaoke. So, so you didn't fall asleep, did you? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was, I was, I, I was designated driver. So uh, it was awesome. But so they're great vehicles, super responsive. So from a, from an auto standpoint, fantastic. So one of the things I did in my book was, uh, and, and this, I, I was led there just because of some of my opinions, but um, there's a, there's an organization called Project Drawdown and it's a nonprofit group. And it's now sort of considered a, uh, it's a think tank that basically says, here's a bunch of climate solutions and here's what they should cost, what we think that they're going to cost, but also uh, how effective in CO2 effect each one of these will have. So I took that. I, I literally took it off their website and I, I, I downloaded it and I sorted it into a spreadsheet that went from, from cheapest to most expensive. In other words, the, uh, the best bang for the CO2 buck at the top and the worst bang for the, and the most expensive at the bottom. And because I just wanted to know what they were and and say, you know, so, you know, if we only have a limited amount of money to spend, which we do, which are the most effective. So I sorted them and out of the 75 options. OK, and that's in the book. It's a boring spreadsheet. But when you look at it, kind of eye opening, 75 options. Number 68 was electric vehicles. OK, so that means that in terms of dollars spent per CO2, it's at the bottom. And, the, and you know, 67 was hybrids, which we already have. Okay, the top 30, there, there weren't any energy sources in the top 30. It was all things like reforestation and conservation and education. Um, and the top, I think the top energy option was number 33, which was distributed solar, rooftop solar. So that just tells you that our solutions that are being proposed are way off base with their effect on the climate, which is again, why I wanted to dig into this. So electric vehicles, they're, they're fine if I had money to burn. Um, but I, honestly, I have a personal problem with, uh, you know, every Tesla has $30,000 of public money attached to that thing in the name of climate salvation. And I'm thinking, you know what? That 30,000 bucks could go a long ways towards schools and mental health programs and drug abuse programs, right? Think of what public $30,000 of public money per, um, uh, per, per car comes around to. I'm, I'm from Oakland and from downtown Oakland, not a good part of town. And I was driving through there a few weeks ago and, you know, it's not a good, it's not good. It's, it's, you know, open alcoholism, drug use, crime, graffiti. It's just not a good part of town. And I remember thinking the last thing that this area needs is solar panels or EV charging stations. They need jobs. They need community centers. They need mental health resources, right? They need things that that poor inner cities need. And so the idea that we are gonna EV our way into somehow climate uh, nirvana is, is just fantasy. And, I, and so I did it in my book, I at least looked at the numbers and I go, this is why it's just, we will never get there. You can't EV your way to lower CO2. It just doesn't work. It's simple arithmetic. So, so I may buy one in the future just because I like it as a car, but I won't do it at because I probably won't just because I'll feel guilty from a client standpoint. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for sharing that and elaborating and um, putting the metrics in your book, because I think um, when people see metrics and they have something, um, not just quantitative, but qualitative data, they could uh, measure the two together to really draw their own conclusion. Um, one of the other things that, that you mentioned that was profound was the amount of money that Tesla has, the over 30K. And one thing that like always bothered me because we don't have universal health care like my family in Canada does um, for various reasons and we won't go into that. But one thing that I, that always bothered me is like whenever you go to these big metropolitan system, um, um, not systems, cities, there's only two government hospitals and they're very far off. So if yeah. someone needs medical care and they may not necessarily have the tier insurance, and maybe they're using government insurance, should they be treated any differently as opposed to someone that does have, you know, tier insurance, whether they're self-paying for it or their employer is paying for it? So why do we only have two hospitals for um, for low income or people who are on um, who may not have jobs in these big ass cities, but we have all these 
of amazing hospitals or so they call, but their, their care is still not adequate. So why can't we put money back into the healthcare system? And this is a big area that I'm just drawn to because my father passed from medical negligence on November 25th, 2020. So the day before Thanksgiving and Sorry. the way they treat someone with insurance versus without insurance is absurd. And the minute they hear you say, oh yeah, we have insurance. Oh, come, come, come. Cause like they got my dad in quick, but someone who was there you could see the lady was in pain and she was there for hours and they couldn't even give her a glass of water or whatnot because they said there's different testing that she has to do. And I'm like, this is BS. You still treat somebody like a human being, no matter what. And then mental health. We just got out of mental health awareness month, which was in May, not that long ago. And now June, the month um, is men's health awareness month. So why can't we start looking at things from a pro pragmatic and holistic approach. And when you said $30,000, that could go a long way depending on what resources you're putting that back into. So that was actually eye-opening for me. I'm like, what? Because I had no idea. I was like, I have friends that drive Teslas and they're nice. They are nice. But I was like, I did not know that amount of capital was going into certain areas. That's our money. That's our money. It's So next time you go out with your friend who's driving the Tesla, they're buying dinner. And they should <laughs> They should thank you for that beautiful car. It's a beautiful car. Look, it's, um, you know, one of Tesla's biggest revenue sources are, um, are uh, renewable credits, carbon credits. Okay, so the government is paying them to make electric cars because comparatively, the government has said, you're better than, than people who make dirty cars. So we're going to pay you money to do it. So they made $500 billion, I think, or some ridiculous amount of money. Uh, maybe it wasn't that much, but... Um, on carbon credits, just just because they're they're manufacturing electric vehicles, so that's public money. Um, why do you think all of the the uh, manufacturers are getting into it? Because this is just free money. This is just uh, we we're paying them to build electric vehicles. I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem with uh, hiding behind uh, we're doing it for the climate because they're not. Mm -hmm. This is just governments propping up businesses again i know we're not going to get into politics another discussion but look i mean it's a simple not it's a simple number thirty thousand bucks of, of public money for that tesla man i can think of a lot of different ways to spend that thirty thousand dollars on schools and health care and mental health care and drug programs and i could probably sit here and name 50 items that i would rather spend our public money on than that bright shiny nice tesla yeah, and now I'm going to throw you an audible because we're getting ready to uh, wind down, Mark. So based on climate charity and the work that you're doing um, on the forefront, as well as behind the scenes, is there something else you want to add to the conversation that I may not have asked you about that you want to just interject quickly before we jump into your call to action for the audience? You know, I, I think in general with the climate is I, uh, exactly what we're doing, which is just having a conversation about it. I think it's one of those areas that just seems to be, you know, everyone's afraid of it because you're not allowed to question the science, even though there's lots of things to ask about the science. But, uh, you know, I've, I've lived in this business and I don't want to do it because every time I bring it up, I just get pummeled. Again, the muddy climate middle, right? People that I've known forever will say, well, you just got to believe it. I'm like, well, but I, but you know, but I'm an engineer. And so I know some, you know, you can't, you can't bend gravity. So certain things aren't right. So just being open to number one, having a dialogue about it, like exactly like what we're doing, but number two, being willing, I'm totally willing to be wrong on this. I'm not a scientist. I've made some opinions about scientists. Scientists are probably going to read this and go, dude, you, you have no idea what you're talking about. Although I think I do know mostly what I'm talking about, but if I'm wrong, correct us, let's come up with a real plan. I think most of us would agree that it's a problem, especially for our kids, that we got to handle it uh, responsibly and pragmatically, but we're not going to reverse the earth and everyone's careers and society to make it happen. And so where's that real solution that we can search for? So let's keep talking is my, uh, is my call to action. We have to be able to do more of this if we think that we're going to solve this problem. Amazing. And for someone who's interested in connecting with you further to just engage in a conversation similar like this, what's your website, Mark? And where do you primarily hang out on social media? Yeah, the website is climaturity.com. So that's that's where it is. And uh, it's a pretty simple website where I, um, uh, I guess, hang out on social is probably LinkedIn. 
Um, I do a lot of uh, writing and uh, just, that's how this whole project started was just writing on LinkedIn. So uh, LinkedIn myself, Mark Cortez, but also under Climaturity. Um, and I will post things there as long as LinkedIn lets me because they're super sensitive to climate stuff. And so, uh, so we'll see even, uh, uh, you know, you just never know how the, uh, the social media czars will uh, decide, but that's a, it's a, it's, it's a good place to have, to find information and at least have a dialogue. So once again, Mark, thank you for coming on the platform and talking about climate maturity, informing me on your knowledge from not just an engineering perspective, but also a personal and professional perspective since you've been in the industry since the 90s. So, you know, quite some time. Um, audience, Mark's contact information will be in the show notes. So climaturity.com. And then you could find him on LinkedIn under Mark. That's M-A-R-C, Cortez, C-O-R-T-E-Z. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and follow. We're on 40 plus platforms. We're also ranked in the top 2% globally out of 2.8 million podcasts per metrics on www.listennotes.com for those who like to do your due diligence and fact check, look it up. And you can see this video on our YouTube channel by going to GEMS, G-E-M-S with Genesis on Mars Kemp. And lastly, but not least, we are looking for brand sponsors. If you wanna have your products products and services heard right here for a paid sponsorship, send me an email to genesisamarskemp at gmail.com or check out the website, genesisamarskemp.net. Not only um, have I been doing this podcast for, for some time, I've also been featured in magazines and over five dozen other shows as guest appearances. So you'll definitely have your content wet, wetly, um spread wide because it's about how can we have a conversation together and how are we here to educate, inspire, and motivate, which are the pillars behind this show. So we could go a lot faster and further when we partner together to really create those synergies. So until the next segment, peace, love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day.